Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming back and joining me tonight here on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and tonight, what a great lineup we have in store for you. Can't wait to share these three guests with you tonight. First up, I'm going to be joined by Golf Pride Channel Marketing Manager, Charlie Fisher. Looking forward to talking with Charlie about you know, one thing that I think is badly overlooked when we all go out and get our clubs fitted, and that's grip size. We, spend a t- we tend to spend a lot of time you know, about the lie, the loft, the shaft, all of those things, but we overlook the, the grip, and that's our connection to the golf club. So we're going to spend some time talking with Charlie about how we can find the right grip size for ourselves. We'll find out from Charlie and, you know, to talk about grip size, right? You, first, you got to start with a hand, right? And size our hand from the right point to the right point, right? And you can find some of that on their website, on Golf Pride's website. But we'll talk about that, how to figure out where we need to measure from. We'll also talk about some of the great new alignment grips, which I'm very excited about, that they are going to be coming out with this year, plus their putter grips as well. So we'll talk about all of those things, plus maybe some of the cool things that Charlie saw when he was down at the PGA Merchandise Show a couple of weeks ago as well. So Charlie is set to join me here in just a few minutes. Following him, I'm going to get a return visit from one of the top instructors in the game, and that's Travis Fulton. You also know Travis as a frequent co-host of the Golf Channel's, Golf Channel's Morning Drive show. So we'll talk with Travis about some tips on, you know, making sure that we have the right pre-shot routine, right? How do, we, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we have a repeatable pre-shot routine? How we can hit better uh, bump and run shots, right? You know, do we use the same club all the time? Do we use a different club depending on the distance we are to the pin? Plus, you know, we'll get a tip on how we can fix the slice, right? We all have a, a problem with that. So we'll talk about how we can stay away from that dreaded thing. Travis is going to join me a little bit later on in this half hour. Then we'll round out tonight's show with four-time winner on the PGA Tour, Tim Simpson. Tim was an All-American at the University of Georgia back in the mid-1970s. We'll talk about his time playing there and teaming up with Chip Beck. We'll also talk about his four victories out on tour. He's now spending time teaching the game as well, so we'll talk about some of his teaching philosophies and how he goes about motivating his students. So really excited to get Tim as part of the show a little bit later on in the hour. So, folks, more great stories and instruction coming your way tonight here on this edition of Next on the Tee. Thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me over the next hour. And, folks, as you know, we are sponsored by the French Lick Resort. Let's hear a word from our good friend Steve Rondonero about all the great things they have going on up there. When planning your next golf buddy trip, consider something completely different for 2018 at French Lick Resort. The Eagles, Birdies, and Pigeons Package. That's right, Pigeons. Take your best shot with a day at our Pete Dye course, a day at our Donald Ross course, then top it off with an outing at our new sporting clay shooting range. This package is reserved for groups of 12 or more. Just you and a pal craving a world-class golf getaway? Well, our Hall of Fame package can't be beat for a pure golf experience and value. Pete Dye, Donald Ross, and our two historic hotels make a legendary combination. French Lick Resort can also help you bring your game to the next level. Check out our Early Birdies Tune-Up, our Game Changer, and Rapid Recovery Golf Academies. Start making those 2018 plans now with an online visit to FrenchLick.com. French Lick Resort, home of the 2018 Senior LPGA Championship and the Symmetra Tour Donald Ross Classic. Yeah, folks, be sure to go online to FrenchLick.com to see for yourself how great a place it is and to book your stay as well. And folks, have you heard me talking about Club Hub sensors over the last few months? It's the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out there on the market. Other shot trackers tell you what happened. Club Hub tells you what happened and why. Take the progress that you make on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have Club Hub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips, and I can tell you. Since I put the Club Hub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing the game. Not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards and the green, but after your round, you can look back at the images and layout of every hole in the course that you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. And no other GPS tool on the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Android or iPhones, and the app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, your angle of attack, plus a 3D view of your swing as well. I know the rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com to order your set of Club Hub sensors today and enter the coupon code NEXT, 
That's N-E-X-T to get 10% off on all products at checkout. Again, clubhubgolf.com, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS and swing analysis tool on the market for a great low price, and you're going to see your game in a whole new way. We're also excited to be partnering with the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. They are back with the same great equipment that you know and love without the retail markup that you hate. You can now buy premium Ben Hogan irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, and bags directly from the factory at prices your wallet is really going to appreciate. Visit them online at BenHoganGolf.com or give them a call at 844-53-HOGAN. That's 844-534-6426 to learn more and order your set today. Please also check out our friends at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. Their early spring collection has arrived. The shift in seasons is an opportunity to change things up, layer upon layer. They've added some great details, fresh colors, and new additions with genuine, enduring character. See the new spring collection by going online to bobbyjones.com. And friends, as you know, we are partnering with Russ Holden and the great folks over at Caddy for a Cure. And one of the most unique opportunities in the world of professional golf is available to you through Caddy for a Cure. You get to spend a day inside the ropes with one of the world's best players as their caddy. It is a fantastic way to have the time of your life while supporting our wounded service members and Fanconi Anemia. You're going to get to walk side by side with your tour player experiencing professional golf as an insider. In addition to the amazing experience you're going to have, you're going to get a fantastic gift package from Caddy for a Cure, which, uh, which includes Under Armour logo apparel and an eyewear package, a tour grade caddy bib suitable for autographs and framing, a tin cup ball marking gift, chef's cut real jerky, and professional photographs of your day. Go online to Caddy for a Cure, that's C-A-D-D-Y-F-O-R-A-C-U-R-E, caddyforacure.com to learn more. All right, now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Golf Pride Channel Marketing Manager, Charlie Fisher. Let me give you some background on Charlie. He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in professional golf management from Methodist University. He has his MBA from the University of Phoenix. He started out as an assistant golf professional at Siwanoi Country Club up in Bronxville, New York, which is a beautiful Donald Ross design course, which uh, was the site of the very first PGA Championship back in 1916. From there, Charlie became a first assistant golf professional at Colasaja Country Club over in uh, Highlands, North Carolina, which is an Arnold Palmer design course. Charlie spent seven years with the Akushnik Company in various roles, ranging from consumer test coordinator to product test supervisor. He joined Golf Pride back in 2011 as a territory sales manager. He's ascended up through the organization and is now cha- uh, channel marketing manager, and I'm honored that he is with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Charlie, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having us on tonight. So, Charlie, I want to start our time with you by going all the way back to your time at Siwanoi Country Club. It's a historic track, back, you know, again, going back to 1901, a rich history there, like I was mentioning in your intro. Talk about what it was like being a part of that historic country club. I'll tell you, Chris, um, Siwanoi, super special place in Bronxville, uh, New York. And, and as you mentioned, uh, it, it was home to the first PGA Championship won by uh, Long Jim Barnes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how, how a short course can really come up and bite you when you, when you think of it, because it's tight, it's got small greens and, and, uh, some rolling hills along there, but what a great experience. And just, it's funny to think back to those days as an assistant and how it really kind of led me here, all the grips that I, that I did up at Sidewalk Country Club. So, <laughs> and, and Charlie, so you go from there, right down to Colasaja down in North Carolina. How, how did you get, from you know Bronxville, New York, down down to the uh, uh, down to the, you know the, the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. Well, you know, Chris, uh, it's funny. I mean, the mountains of North Carolina. I had done some internships in college at, at some other courses around the area, and and the golf industry, um, as you well know, it's always the two degrees of separation. So somebody that I had worked with uh, previously um, had become the head professional at Colasaja Club, and um, just through keeping in touch. Uh, the opportunity came up, and um, it was a really good chance. I, I love the state of North Carolina. Clearly, Golf Pride is located you know, right in the heart of North Carolina in the home of golf in Pinehurst, and um, it was just a really good chance to, to get back to someplace I consider home. So um, 
Cal Sage, it was a, a great, you know, it's very seasonal up there in the mountains. It, it draws, you know, people come up for the summer. And uh, I think back when I worked up there, wintertime population was about 2,000 and summertime population was well over 20. So it was a place where people would come and, and spend a, a good deal of their summer. So. And, Charlie, from there you join a Kushnet. So you, you go all the way out to Carlsbad, California, right? So how were they able to lure you away from the Blue Ridge Mountains <laughs> all the way out to the West Coast? Well, first, Chris, they lured me up to uh, Fairhaven, Massachusetts. So I spent the uh, the first almost two and a half years um, of my career with uh, with Titleist up in Massachusetts, and uh, started off in the customer customer service realm, and um, it was a great great training ground uh, to get to talk to a lot of uh, accounts on the phone and, and learn the product language. And then um, I was on a project called the Science Van, and uh, that project lasted for about eight years. It was a a really um, in-depth in project where they, they gathered a lot of golf ball uh, information, ball flight data, you know, using the the title performance monitor. And um, But more or less, I think we had 200 plus drivers and we were fitting guys, you know, getting a lot of different launch conditions off the driver and uh, just, just a lot of fun. You got to learn the fit, you learn the product, you were talking to consumers all the time, but probably about a year or so after I was on that, that project ended and, uh, you know, asked me if I'd be willing to move to the West Coast and, um, it, it was it, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. And it really was, I met my wife and then I, you know, led to other, other opportunities. I worked for a great manager out there. So it was a really good opportunity for me. <laughs> and, and Charlie, now, now you're with golf pride. So talk about the role that you have now with golf pride. Sure. So my role now, I'm channel marketing manager and you know, it's funny. We have uh, the last five years or so we've really, um, taken on a, a the face of the company has changed i relate it to you know, if you think in terms of like mature companies you know when they kind of in that they've been around for a long time they, they do what they do and that's what they do uh golf pride we brought in you know i say you know, the company evolved has really evolved over the past several years we brought in a new management team and they really have kind of restructured re, you know really painted a vision for um this this culture of innovation and technology that really has like it just it's just taken on this whole new breath. So we went from this mature company, mature kind of stage of, you know, of a corporation to uh, almost this startup. I mean, it's this exciting new place to be. Um, and you've seen it with all the, the new products that we've had. I mean, year after year after year, um, it's it's we've really ramped up on so many different levels. So with that said, um, you know, we've been able to create these new products. And now we're trying to tell the story in store. And so my job is to work with our retail partners and distributor partners to tell that story in store. And so mostly is visual merchandising and, and, uh, but a lot of what I've done, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're all, we're a small company as big as we are. We're a global brand, but we're really a small team. So everybody wears a lot of hats. So whether it's consumer testing, um, whether it's, you know, uh, getting, the, getting a chance to, to, uh, you know, talk to, you know, people, consumers, and uh, you know, retail partners sitting down with buyers and and uh, merchandisers. That's really what my role entails. Is it's, it's a lot of different things. So we all wear a lot of hats, but mostly mostly uh, visual merchandising and and that element. And Charlie, you you alluded to this a, a few moments ago, but New World headquarters down there, at Pinehurst Number Eight. I'll tell you, Chris, it's something uh, we've got it coming in 2019. Um, to, you know, it's, it's for us, we call it like our global innovation center right now. We've got, you know, we're in a small town, small, you know, uh, area of Pinehurst here, and we've got three different locations. We have a tour warehouse that's separate from our main building. We've got our R and D facility, which is, you know, probably 10 or 15 minutes away from our main headquarters. But this is really for us, you know, as, as you know, really changing and shifting our mindset and really trying to get the team uh, at at our, at our home office, everybody focused on this is what we're trying to do. And when you do that, we have all these people spread out all over the place and it's hard to kind of have these conversations. I think we're most, uh, you know, productive when we have these one off, you know, kind of conversations in the hallway and those don't happen enough. And I really believe that this global innovation center is going to do that. And to tell you for us, what we're most excited about is this is where we're really going to tell the story about how to, um, and, and really create that consumer experience for how people should actually go through the process of getting fit for grips. And, you know, it's, it's funny, everybody, um, you know, I think we, we've gotten to this point where 
uh, in fitting. Its grips are kind of an afterthought in, in the fitting, you know, in the full club fitting experience. And it's, you know, for us, we do a ton of consumer testing. We do even our own testing where we go out and uh, secret shop how are grips sold, you know, how are grips sold in store, uh, what type, you know, what are, what are some of the big fitting facilities or, you know, fitting outfits, how are they, you know, portraying grips, where do, how, you know, where's the priority of grips uh, in the actual club fitting experience. And if you really think of it, I mean, club fitting com- is, is comprised of a club head, right? And that's where a lot of the technology is, 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 you know, the major OEMs are putting a lot of R and D work into the club head technology. And then you have the shaft, same thing with the shaft OEM. They're putting a lot of technology. And then the, there's the one part that you actually hold on to. So you have the part that's hitting the ball, the part that's, you know, helping direct the club head into the ball. But then there's the piece where you're actually holding on to the club. And there's a lot of technology that Golf Ride's putting into these grips. And um, we're, we just want to make sure that everybody gets the, gets the right one for their game. So yeah, we're going to tell that, that you know, to that end, Charlie, that's, that, that's one of the things that, you know, I've always, you know, we've talked about it on this show a, a number of different times, but that's sort of the, the piece that gets left out, you know, to your point. Right. You, you get fit for, you know, your shaft, you get fit for, you know, your lie angle, you get, you know, for your launch angle and all of those sorts of things. But where the club actually connects to our body at the grip, eh, we don't really spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out what size grip we're supposed to have, how to figure out what size grip we need. And, you know, I went on your website and there's, you know, some things for you that you, know, you can do online where it t- talks about how you measure from, you know, your wrist to the top of your your uh, your middle finger and that sort of thing, but talk about why it's so important that we figure out what right size grip that we need. Sure, I mean it's it's this. I always relate it to this, you know, and and certainly spent a lot of time in my life running and going through the process of getting fit for the right shoe, right? You know, when a shoe's too big for you, your toes they tend to kind of hold on to the inside of the shoe, right? And you know that's I'm not saying that that's the same thing that happens with a grip, but you know if you think of if you think of uh, you know, um, I'm just trying to, to use another quick analogy, but I, I think the, the idea is, is you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to walk in something that's not fit for you. And it's the same thing with a grip. Um, if a grip's too small, I'm convinced, I'm 100% convinced that you hold on to the club too, too tight because you're trying not to lose it throughout your swing. And, you know, the, the old uh, adage, if a grip's too big, you know, the, then you tend to, you know, mis, misdirection to the right, you know, to the left or however, more, more than likely people say that you lose it to the right. And, um, you know, I feel like um, the first thing and just as in everything, there's the in club, regular club fitting, there's the static fit, which you do take those measurements that we make recommendations for. That's a very, very basic foundation for what size grip do you need. But some people have larger palms, Chris. Some people have longer fingers. And that's not necessarily like the, the true, true measure. And that's where the dynamic fit comes in too. So you actually want to make sure that, you know, when you're gripping the club, that your fingers aren't tucked too much into your palm or under you, the top of your hand. Um, but then also with, for us, and we've got all these different technologies, we've got, you know, four families of grips plus um, added technology, visual technology onto the club. You know, it's not just about size. I mean, we have sizes in all of our major families, ranging from undersized to jumbo. Main thing is, is, you know, when you're playing in all these different conditions, you have different types of, you know, everybody has a, some people have sweaty palms, some people have dry hands. Um, some people play in, you know, uh, dry weather. Some people play in uh, humid weather. So we have all these different technologies that uh, add to, the, you know, that are, that are designed to add to the performance of your game. So first and foremost, with ranges, you know, size ranges and all of our technologies, you want to make sure that you're in the right technology. You know, if you need something that's a little bit more uh, shot, you know, uh, uh, shock, shock absorbing, maybe you want to, you know, something that's softer, that's built up a little bit more in the bottom hand. That's what we have the CP2 line for. Uh, the same thing with, if you, you know, you're looking for a good all-weather grip with some uh, softer in the bottom hand, similar to uh, the, the MCC Plus 4. And, you know, we've, we've launched this new Align technology, which we launched it in t- 2017. And I'll tell you, this, this has really been one of the biggest innovations in, in golf. Um, you know, and what we're all looking for is consistency. We're all looking for something that can help us grip the club the same way every single time and, and just reduce, you know, uh, one of those things, uh, you know, one other element, one other variable that's already hard. We, we can't control the weather. We can't control the wind and uh, the speed of the greens and those things. But what we can control is the way that we grip the club. And that's what this Align technology does. 
You know, it allows us to grip the club consistently the same way every single time. And we just launched it in the Tour of Velvet this year uh, at the PGA show, something we're really excited about. So back to answer that, answer that question, we start with technology first, and then we have sizes and, and almost every technology to fit your game. And I want to build off what you just said, Charlie, because the Tour of Velvet Align Grip is something I'm very excited about. So talk about what it is and talk about what the Align piece is so that our, our listeners get a, an appreciation for and an anticipation of what we're going to be able to see later this year. Well, sure. What we found um, is that nearly one-third, I mean, it's one of those things where a rib grip, you know, the traditional rib grip was something that was you know, on so many clubs almost, you know, I don't want to say I don't have an actual percentage, but on, on a lot of clubs, you know, produced, uh, you know, way back when. And you think back to, you hear the stories of people taking a coat hanger, you know, and sticking it under their, you know, taping it to the bottom of the shaft and putting it in the right place and uh, really, you know, having this exaggerated pronounced feel under, you know, they could grip it in their fingers. And uh, still to this day, nearly one third of all tour players, play a rib grip and we know that because of the grips that we ship out the tour and because we have you know a tour rep out there monitoring this stuff all the time so obviously uh you know we're, we're constantly building grips for consumers but they're always validated by tour right and we want to make sure when we have over 80 percent of the guys on the pga tour playing our product we got to make sure that we get this stuff right and that we're making stuff that they want and uh and then also try to understand why are they using it so when we see this huge trend out there of you know, a third of the guys are still using a rib grip. Let's try to understand why. And that's what we found. They were looking for something that they just don't have to think about. They can put it in their hands. They can feel where the rib is. Um, and so for us, we launched it last year in the multi-compound uh, and the multi-compound plus four. And for us, uh, with Tour Velvet still being the number one grip played on Tour, um, it just made sense to, to launch it in the Tour Velvet, Tour Velvet grip this year. So we're, it, it should be hitting shelves here at the end of April, and we're really excited about it. So, Yeah, I don't blame you. So am I. I can't wait to get my hands on a set of those grips. So, yeah, looking forward to that at the end of April. And, and talk about so what you've got available now, right, and you, you mentioned about the, the compounds. You've got the, MM, the MCC Align, and you've got the MMC Plus 4 Align. Talk about the difference between that and what we'll, what we'll eventually see with the Tour Velvet. Sure. So, you know, the multi-compound family was designed, it's, we, we call it our hybrid grip, right? So it's got a cord, a firmer uh, rubber compound on the top half with, uh, with the brush cotton technology. And uh, then on the bottom half, it has a softer compound. So what you, you really get the, the soft feel on the bottom hand, but you have the firm feel on the top half, which, you know, it's, it's it, you re, you're related to. You don't really want too, too, too much uh, of a soft grip on top because then you start to add in some torque, especially at higher swing speeds. Uh, and when you have, you know, 30, 40 guys on tour each week playing a multi-compound, it tells you that they like that firm upper half. And especially when there's cord up top, all the conditions that those guys play in. And then the plus four, um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit softer on the bottom hand and it's built up. So the plus four was designed out of, uh, you know, we found again, the trend where guys were building, tour players were building their bottom half up, the equivalent of about, the equivalent of about four wraps on the bottom hand. So by the time that you actually build it up, um, you know, you, you've added all these other elements. So for us, it just made sense to make a grip that already had uh, the equivalent of four grips. So we've added the Align technology to both of those. And then again, this year with the Tour of Velvet. So let me just explain a little bit more about what the Align piece is. The Align strip that's on the back, it's actually molded on the back side of our grip. And so what we've done is it's, a, it's about 50% firmer. It's a 50% uh, firmer rubber piece of rubber on the back. It's got a, uh, a, a flex channel that's around it. So we call it a flex channel. You know, it really is activated. It helps activate that strip on the back when it's actually installed. So we took the kind of outside-in approach versus the inside-out, where the traditional rib usually had something on the inside that actually helped protrude. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, where it was actually kind of molded into the, to the base of the grip. Well, this grip actually has a, has a ridge on the inside that actually helps protrude that firmer piece of rubber. And then by the time you had the flex channel, it really exposes that, um, that, that raised ridge. And, you know, this is all within the confines of the USGA. That's one thing that Golf Pride, we, you know, again, making products for the best players in the world. We've got to have stuff that conforms to the USGA's rules. So we are at the max limit that we can potent, you know, possibly make this, make this, uh, this rib grip. So, um, and adding it to the Tour Velvet again with, our number one grip plate on tour. This is, you know, with the Tour Velvet's been around since 1993, uh, and 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 adding a slight change to to the rubber compound just to kind of 
so that we could uh, uh, have this aligned technology. It's it's just we're the feedback has been amazing and and really excited to get it going. So. And Charlie, when I went on golfbride.com and went through the online fitting, it, it set me up for the Align family of, of grips. But one of the alternative kind of grips that said that might also fit my game, and you mentioned these uh, a few moments ago as well, is the CP2 Wrap and the CP2 Pro. And I like a, a smooth wrapped grip. Talk about those grips as well. Well, the CP2, so we, we do, we have the Wrap and the Pro. And um, that grip is, is our softest rubber compound. I mean, from a durability standpoint, from, uh, from a soft feel standpoint, that grip is, is second to none. And we've just experienced, I mean, it seems like every single year we keep getting more and more growth. And it's, it's, it's hard to believe a grip that's been around for three years now uh, is growing at the rapid pace that it is. And um, what we've done with that grip is the soft, the soft feel uh, is, is, is great, especially in the bottom hand. But to get that soft feel uh, and still have a performance edge to it and not, not lose that, that uh, you know, a lot of the um, performance in terms of club, club face control, we added the control core. So really, if you were to actually pop that grip open or cut it open when you, when you remove it, you'd actually see uh, the control core. It's, that's, that's actually molded. So we have this soft rubber that's actually molded around this control core. And what it does is it gives us a ton of, uh, you know, it reduces the torque on the top half, that lead hand, um, regardless of your right hand or your left hand, it, it reduces the torque up top there. So you don't, you don't experience a lot of the twisting. Um, and, and really, again, we're, we're back to that performance element. Everybody has got some different performance need. Um, and, and that's what we've done there with the CP2. So you've got soft, you've got a, a built up reduced taper in the bottom hand, which, again, is a trend that's, that's really been tapped into. And, and I want to point out one thing with Align and CP2, um, and certainly we don't pay players to play our product. We don't pay, pay one person to play our, our product on tour. But what's amazing is, is uh, we, had, we have one player, it's the same player, uh, and he's now on the Champions Tour. He, he's won both. The first week he put the CP2 into play, and the, the, the next the two years later he put the plus four Align into play, and he won a senior major uh, the first week having them both in play. Two completely different wow. games, contrasting. And, but it's amazing that the first week he had him, had him in play, he won, won a senior major. Him, so it was, uh, That's awesome. That's Charlie, just a couple more before we let you go. And, and one of the other you know, frequently asked questions, and I'm sure you get this all the time, is how frequently should we be ripping, re-gripping our clubs? What's the frequency, and how do we know when it's time you know, to change grips? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris, and, and that's something that, you know, as the category leader, we're always, you know, trying to be the, the storyteller of how often should you be regripping. You're right. Uh, we recommend at least once a year. Um, you know, when you look at the best players in the world changing their grips every six to eight weeks, um, that should tell you something. Now, granted, this is what they do for a living. They're playing, they're practicing. Um, but, but for us, we recommend at least once a year. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're playing 100 rounds a year, you know, 40 to 50 rounds, on a, and several uh, sessions on the range, you're probably going to be due um, at, at minimum, you know, once a year. But then also you think of your seven irons, your wedges, your drivers, the clubs that you use the most in your bag, those should be getting it a couple times a year. But, you know, uh, we always encourage people to, to, you know, keep their grips clean um, and try to maximize the life out of them. And, you know, there's always, whether it's UV rays, whether it's sunscreen or just natural oil from your hands, the best way to knock that off is just, you know, a wet towel and a, a good good scrub there, but once a year is, is, is probably a good good way to go by. And Charlie, let's quickly move over to putters. Talk about your Tour Sensor straight and your uh, Contour pistol grips. Well, I'll tell you, Tour Sensor is, is another one for us, and, and talking about how we've, we've done consumer testing, we've, you know, for us, what we found is, is that uh, some of these, with, with rubber grips, players were able to get a, a lot more feedback back. And that's something with putting that you, that you have to have. You have to have feel. You have to be able to kind of have a sense of where you're striking the ball in the face. Helps you judge distance. And, and also just, just the overall swing in the putter. Uh, the tour sensor, it comes in two different, two different shapes. So our, our whole concept was, is, you know, not everybody's hand is the same. Not everybody wants, you know, uh, a, just a perfectly straight tapered grip like our, um, like our straight, contour right the, the blue and the black version um they wanted something that fit maybe a little bit more into their palm so we offered two different shapes with that and inside of that we had two different sizes and you know 
I can tell you um, from being a part of a lot of the consumer testing, the, the feedback was, was great. And we continue to, this grip is still growing for us. We see it in, um, you know, with, with the players that are still winning with it um, on tour um, and, and putting it in play. And it just continues to gain popularity. So we're, we're really excited about it. But, um, you know, we have a smaller version and then we have a, a little bit larger version. But the whole concept with the sensor, and, and that's hence in, even in the name, is that it really provides that feel and feedback that players are looking for, play, that players prefer. So I'll tell you a stat that's something just real fast, Chris, that we found is that, you know, it's, it's nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 of the top 10 players in, in strokes game putting. Um, it's something we've just been looking at here in the office. Um, a, a good majority of them are using a rubber putter, rubber, rub, rubber putter grip. So that's something that for us that, you know, we're, we're trying to take notice in the way that we're developing, you know, our the different materials and things that we're putting into, um, you know, coming up, why are they using this and understanding that? And that really goes into, you know, our whole just deep, deep love of, of technology and, and understanding and, and research. So we've, we've been doing a ton of research, uh, independent testing and internal testing to understand all these different elements of, of the grip. So. So, Charlie, before we let you go, let our listeners know, what do you have coming up and how can our listeners follow you guys and you in particular online and over social media as well? Well, for, for me personally, Chris, I don't know that I'm all that interesting because everything I like on social media is golf pride. It's all golf pride all day, every day. Um, but golf pride, uh, golf pride.com is a huge resource for anything and everything grip related. Uh, we're also on Facebook, uh, Instagram and, uh, and Twitter. So we've, we're always, we've got a ton of consumer promotions that we run seasonally out there and that's the best place to get all of the, uh, uh greatest and latest golf pride news out there so we love we love our consumers we love our, our, our players and and um you know always looking to connect with them too so very good charlie thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come and be a part of the show i hope you'll come back and join me again sometime soon talk more about the things that you've got going on talk about the launch of the tour velvet align which i am greatly anticipating and all the great things you guys are doing over there at golf pride i really appreciate your time tonight Thank you, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for what you do. Thanks for the content that you provide your listeners and really appreciate you having us on. So thank you very much. Charlie. Take care. All the best in your family. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. Thanks, Chris. Have a good night. You too, Charlie. That's Charlie Fisher. Again, he is the, uh, the uh, marketing channel manager there at Golf Pride, golfpride.com. Go online, check it out, folks. They got a lot of great grips that you can find online, and they do. They have an online sizing tool. Kind of gives you an idea of how you need to size your hand and, you know, the opportunity to find the right grip for you. And they take you through a lot of different scenarios to find out which kind of grip is uh, going to be right for your game. Go online, check it out. Give them a follow on Twitter. Great stuff. Look forward to having Charlie back on the show again real soon all right now back with me on the french lick resort guest line is travis fulton let me remind you about travis's background he was raised in kellogg idaho he played three years of college golf at lewis and clark state college which is a uh, nia school up there in lewiston idaho he won the pacific northwest athletic conference championship his junior year firing a final round 66 to win by a stroke on that same course course where he won that title and that was at bryden canyon golf course he holds the course record of 61. travis is now the lead instructor at pablo uh, creek country club there in jacksonville as well as the victoria national in evansville indiana he has been a contributing writer to pga tour.com and golf illustrated He's been named a top 40 under 40 instructor by Golf Digest and best teacher in the state of Florida. He's a regular co-host there on the Golf Channel's Morning Drive. He has worked with Fred Funk and Len Matisse out on tour, and I'm delighted that he is back with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Good evening, Travis. Thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, you bet, Chris. Thanks for uh, taking me back in time to those uh, to those college days. That uh, that sounded great. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, Travis, first of all, before we get into all the golf stuff, got to get your thoughts. I know you're a, you're a football fan. Give me your thoughts on the Super Bowl. Well, what a what an exciting Super Bowl! You know, to you don't watch very many games, let alone a the biggest game of the year where you go back and forth like that and put up the kind of yards that they did and and, uh, and only have one punt um, the entire game. It was. Uh, it was it was fun to watch. I didn't really have a uh, a dog in the fight, but um you know, I got to tell you, I think um the whole story of Nick Foles and you know what um 
he's been through in his his pro career to to be put into that situation after Carson Wentz went down and and lead that team to the to the Lombardi Trophy, I think is pretty darn cool. Yes, agreed. And Travis, I noticed uh, you were down at the PGA Merchandise Show a few yeah. weeks ago. Anything cool or anything new down there in particular catch your eye while you were walking around? Well, you know, there's, uh, you know, first and foremost, the traffic was really good. You know, I always kind of, um, you know, I always kind of gauge the the traffic day two in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, and it was still buzzing. You know, late in the day. Uh, on day two so that was good to see um you know as far as like new and creative tech things i think it was uh, uh the leader in that i think is 18 birdies which is a group that um that i'm doing some work in really an up-and-coming uh a group that's uh out of silicon valley there in california and um for for your listeners that haven't had a chance to download 18 birdies it's a it's a free app you should do that and uh it's very cool there's a lot of uh Neat features in it. I think it's one of the best GPS um, systems that interfaces with Google that's uh, in the game, the statistical analysis, and and it's a really neat um, online community that uh, they've done a nice job kind of bringing Twitter and Instagram together within the app, and and the community is really strong and active and sharing a lot of things. So I think they're really a, a strong force uh, that's coming on, and i um, happy to be doing some work with them. And speaking of Twitter, Travis, Harry Arnett, the uh, senior VP of marketing for Callaway, tweeted out a question. Is it easier to build a game around great driving or great putting? And you responded by saying great driving. Why? Yeah, yeah I did. And um, I think, you know, Harry and I disagree on that probably a little bit in a certain, um, you know, skill set. But, you know, I, I think when you when you look at driving, um, the ability. When I say great driving, um, I you know what I'm talking about is is a player has um, adequate distance and accuracy for their particular skill set, and and not only on the PGA Tour. We've seen the shift in the PGA Tour where length um, has you know for the most part become the number one factor in the game. That doesn't discount the other parts of the game. We all know that they're important, but when you look at the top drivers of the golf ball, strokes gained off the tee versus strokes gained putting, you quickly see names that you recognize on strokes gained off the tee and, and, and names that you might not recognize in strokes gained putting. So we see the difference in distance, but I think it carries even some weight down into the mid-handicap. If you have a mid-handicap who's driving it a little bit longer um, than their counterparts and can keep it in play, um, you know that distance and accuracy combined – um, I think it's a little bit easier to build a game around. And when you're certainly you're building a golfer from a young age, you want them to create speed, you want them to get it out there, and then kind of harness that in as you go and, and allow them to hit more fairways and greens. And, Travis, another tweet that I saw you weighed in on came from Peter Costas. And he said, information is not knowledge and knowledge is not wisdom. Studying pictures Launch monitor numbers, force place vectors don't make a knowledgeable teacher. Great teaching is part science and mostly art and communication. And you agreed with that. Talk about why. Yeah, yeah I do. I did agree with that. And, you know, I think we've we've entered an information era, right, a tech area era that, um, you know, instructors have a lot available to them. And I think we, we, we have young teachers that are learning um things about the golf swing a lot quicker than maybe when I got into the uh, industry, say, 18, 19 years ago, when a lot of this information wasn't readily available, that you could just go in and, and, and get up to speed when it comes to 3D video, up to speed when it comes to how a player is using the ground. I think the science is a little bit more understood now, um, you know, why the golf ball does what it does. And I think that's part of it. You know, I think that's part of it as a teacher is to understand those things, advance your learning, um, stay on the cutting edge and the curve of, of what the science is telling us. But when it comes to the application, um, I think that's just a very small part of it. I think your your best teachers are great communicators. I think your your best teachers are one that are building the appropriate relationships with their students um, that allow them to really dig in and help them, you know, not just from a technique standpoint, um, but allow them to be the best that they can be. And I think more than that, really creating an environment and a practice plan that allows 
students and amateurs to self-discover, you know, and, and allow them um, to not only get good information, but self-discover what it means to them um, in taking those key things away from a lesson plan. Um, and those are the types of things that are everlasting. So information is part of it, but I think the communication side of it and just the application from a teacher's perspective, it, it, it outweighs it most of the time. And Travis, you sent out a tweet last week that, that surprised me a bit. You said both Phil and Tiger last one in, in 2013, Keegan Bradley back in 2012. And of the three, you like <laughs> you like Keegan to win again first. And I'm curious why you say that, and do you still feel that way after the showing we saw from Phil last weekend? You know, I kind of uh, I, I I I secretly uh, cheer for Keegan Bradley to get back. You know, I felt like he kind of really was one of those players that was affected, obviously, when the anchor um, of the putter, you know, went away. I mean, here's a guy that, you know, putted his entire career. It's the only way he really knew how to putt and making a living on that. And, you know, that goes away. And I think he was certainly the most affected. But I think he is slowly getting back. One thing that you know with Keegan Bradley, and I'll go back to this distance, Keegan Bradley is a very underrated driver of the golf ball. He has the tools off the tee to win on the PGA Tour a lot. And we've seen that um, when he had, um, you know, the putter that he needed to do that. And, you know, that the change in the putter set him back, but the ball striking has always been there. And I think he's slowly starting to get comfortable again. You know, he's still a relatively young guy and um, he's healthy. And, um, you know, I think those are things that are positives for him. We we know Tiger, he certainly looks good, but there's always the health question mark. Phil's 47 now and winding down. So of those three, I thought it was interesting. I see Keegan climbing again, and I think he's going to get back in the winner's circle here this year, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was, was here in the next couple months. And, Travis, switching gears a little bit, you do a lot of work with junior players, and you have a junior players all-access section on your website, TravisFoltonGolf.com. Talk about what junior players and their parents, oh, by the way, can find on your website. Well, you know, I think, you know, junior golf's always been um, a very important, you know, part of my business model. And, you know, I enjoy working with a junior player, whether it's um, trying to give kids and parents um, good advice from a from a junior golf all access standpoint, um, or it's working with kids that live here in Northeast Florida that, you know, that have come to my camps over the years in the summer or come and work with me, um, from a one on one perspective. I've always felt, you know, obviously when you're, when you're growing the game, the junior golfer is, is a big part of that. But for me in teaching the game over the last 18, 19 years, it's probably been, um, the number one driving force that's allowed me, you know, to keep, uh, the, the, a, a book, of private lessons year in and year out where you work with junior players, um, you get them to enjoy the game, you get them better in their skill sets, their scores are coming down. There's no greater marketing tool than a junior golfer loving the game of golf and, and getting better because other kids see it, their parents see it, other parents see it, and it just kind of snowballs from there. So, you know, junior golf is, is important to me. I want to see kids get into this game, have a great experience, and play it for the rest of their life. But, uh, you know, in addition to that, it's been uh, a tremendous source for me in running my business. And, Travis, I, I want to get a few playing tips that our listeners can yeah. take out with them on the course this coming weekend. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is pre-shot routines. What should we be doing when it's our turn on the tee box to give ourselves the best opportunity to make sure we're getting the ball out in the fairway? Well, you know, I think um, I think you got to split it up. I think you know, there's things that you're doing behind the ball, and then there's things you're doing uh, over the ball. And I think when you're when you're behind the ball, you know, and you're able to, you know, kind of analyze, you're able to think through, uh, take in the information that you need to take in to, to pick a club and, and and hit the shot that you're about ready to hit. So, you know, you can you can think a little bit more back behind the ball. Um, you can prepare a little bit more back behind the ball. You can analyze a little bit more back behind the ball. But once you cross that line and you get into the ball, then things have to start to become very subconscious. And, and there has to be some kind of cadence there where it's aim the face, 
get your feet in there, one look, two waggles, and pull the trigger. You know, no different than when you wake up in the morning, you have a routine. You have a routine that happens each and every morning, and it's subconscious. And I think that's where you've got to get it to once you cross the line and you get over the ball. So I encourage people to break it up into two sections. You know, think about what you're doing back behind the ball, take it all in, and then from there, once you pull that club and you cross the line and you get over the ball, you've got to have some kind of cadence that's going to allow you to kind of get a little bit more into the subconscious mind. It's going to allow you to be a little bit more instinctive, and it's going to give you that rhythm and that cadence that's going to allow you to pull the trigger and kind of bring it all together towards the target. Travis, let's talk a little bit about the short game now. Yeah. How can we do a better job chipping the ball closer to the hole when we're just sort of just off the green, maybe a few yards off the green, maybe 10 or 20 yards off the green? We need to hit that bump and run shot. How do we do a better job of getting the ball closer to the hole? Well, I think, you know, the answer to that, and certainly here in Florida, when you get into this grain, this, this sticky grain, right, uh, where the leading edge can get, can get caught, you know, I always I always tell people, look, you know, you want to create an environment where you, you let the club head hit the ground, but it doesn't dig. And, and I think that's a really important aspect in really most all of short game shots. There's times you want to use the leading edge. The leading edge can get in and dig a little bit more. But for the most part, you really don't want that to happen. And certainly in a little bump and run, when there's really not that much speed, that's going to support that leading edge to peel a divot. So what I tell people is, look, when you – when you set up, take the club shaft, take a pitching wedge, and lean it just a little bit more upright, and then lean it slightly forward. I think shaft lean's a little bit overdone in general towards the target when we're hitting this chip shot. So stand it up a little bit, lean it ever so gently forward, and then when you grip it, feel your lead wrist has a slight cup to it, just a slight dish in that lead wrist. That left wrist is not going to be flat. It's not going to be bowed. It can be, but just feel a slight shaft lean with a slightly bent left wrist. Put your sternum just right on top of the golf ball, that top button on that shirt. And then from there, use the shoulders back and through. And what's going to happen is with that sternum on top of the ball, maybe the weight just a little bit to the left, that will help get the club head to hit the ball. But that conservative shaft lean, that slightly bent left wrist, will help shallow out the divot. And I think that's a good way to go about those little bump and run shots. And are you an advocate to use the same club every time you mention a pitching wedge? Do you use the same club every time, or do you change your club depending on the distance you know, from the green and from the pin? I think what you'll find is when you use your pitching wedge with that kind of technique, with that conservative shaft lean, if things return the same, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. You know, So if you hit the pitching wedge and carry it eight paces, it'll run out about eight paces, give or take a little bit. Um, you know, I think you have to, I, I, I like the idea of having two for sure and maybe three, you know, have your pitching wedge as your one-to-one -one and then have a sand wedge that might be a little less than one-to-one -one that you can use for short chips and then get to a nine or maybe an eight iron, you know, for those longer chips. So I think two or three clubs um, when you're chipping with that technique uh, should do the trick. Travis, before we let you go, remind our listeners yeah. about what they're going to be able to find on your website. Again, TravisFoltonGolf.com. Yeah, TravisFoltonGolf.com. Um, you can come see me here in uh, in Northeast Florida. Um, I've got you mentioned Pablo Creek, but I also got another facility that I just uh, worked out a a deal with at Jacksonville Golf and Country Club. So another terrific spot here in the Northeast Florida section, and then um, my academy there at Victoria National. Um, in uh, in Evansville, uh, Indiana, and I also have a long distance program. So I've actually got quite a few students long distance that just work with me through my uh, through my digital program, and you can you can get all that information at uh, travisfoltongolf.com. So Travis, how can our listeners follow you outside of your website? How can they follow yeah. you uh, over social media? Yeah. So uh, on uh, on Twitter, it's uh, it's at travisfolton underscore, and then. Um, Instagram there at Travis Fulton uh, Golf as well, and um, and also just uh, uh, for those that are always looking for great information and great communities, I'd, I'd recommend that uh, that 18 Birdies app as well. There's a great community there, and I, I contribute and post a lot of uh, my instruction show, and soon we'll be launching 
um, my own show, Chris, there at through 18 birdies, uh, called the stripe show. So it'll be uh, more information on that instruction show will be coming out here soon on social media in the next couple of weeks. Ah, very exciting. Good for you. I yeah. look forward to catching that as well. So yeah, hopefully, absolutely. hopefully we get the opportunity to get you back on to talk about that and the launch and how that's going. Plus, uh, maybe pick your brain for, uh, some other, uh, uh, uh lessons as well. So it's yeah. always no a privilege to spend some time with you, Travis. All right. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Take care. All the best to you and your family, Travis. That is Travis Fulton. Again, TravisFultonGolf.com is the website, and uh, you can see him on the Golf Channel on the Morning Drive, uh, co-hosting that show pretty frequently as well. All right, before I get to my next guest, Tim Simpson, I want to give a shout-out to a few of our sponsors. First, folks, you've heard me talking about Clubhub Sensors over the last few months. It's the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out there on the market. No other shot tracker tells you what happened like this like this device does. Clubhub tells you what happened and why. That's the other component, and why. Take the progress that you make on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have Clubhub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips, and I can tell you, since I put the Clubhub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing the game. Because not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards and the green, but after your round, you can look back at the images and layout of every hole in the course that you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. No other GPS tool in the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Androids or iPhones. The app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, your angle of attack, plus you get a 3D view of your swing as well. And no other rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com and order your set of Club Hub sensors today and enter the coupon code NEXT. That's N-E-X-T to get 10% off on all products at checkout. Again, clubhubgolf.com, enter the, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS and swing analysis tool on the market at a great low price, and you're going to see your game in a whole new way. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Par Bar. Energy and focus on the course are essential, whether you're playing you know, out on tour in your club championship or just your weekend four ball with your buddies. Par Bar, the golfer's nutritional bar, can help you with both of those things, energy and focus. Eat some before you get to the first tee and the rest every three holes until it's gone, and you're going to play with more energy and focus to win. Par Bar was developed by a lifelong golfer and a food scientist to help all golfers play their best. Go online to parbargolf.com to order yours today. And folks, this segment of the show is sponsored tonight by the PGA Tour Superstore. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at pgasuperstore.com. Now, back to you, Chris. And now joining me on the French Lick Resort guest line is four-time winner on the PGA Tour, Tim Simpson. Let me give you some more background on Tim. He is from right here in Atlanta, Georgia, played his college golf at the University of Georgia, where he lettered in 1975 and 76. He was an honorable mention All-American back in 1975 and a third-team All-American in 76. He was named a first-team All-SEC player both seasons as well. While at Georgia, Tim won the 1975 Palmetto Intercollegiate Tournament and the 1976 Southern Amateur. He finished 21st in the NCAA Championship in 1975 and 14th in 76, turned pro in 77. He won four times on the PGA Tour at the 1985 Southern Open, the 1989 US F&G Classic, and back-to-back years at the Walt Disney World Oldsmobile Open in 89 and 90. He collected five other professional wins, including five Georgia Opens and the uh, Casherol World Championship over in France. He had two top ten finishes in majors, both coming in 1990 at the U.S. Open and the PGA Championship. He was named the Comeback Player of the Year in 1989. In 1990, he was named the Georgia Professional Athlete of the Year. 2004, he was inducted into the State of Georgia Sports Hall of Fame. 2006, he was inducted into the Georgia State Golf Association Hall of Fame and named Comeback Player of the Year on the Champions Tour. And I'm very honored he is with me here tonight on Next on the Tee. Hey, Tim, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, glad to be here, Chris. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you, Tim? Well, I'm doing great, but I only have one bar on my phone, so I'm trying to be real still so I don't drop the call. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you. 
<laughs> so, Tim, I want to start by going back to your time at the University of Georgia. You had a very successful two years there. You got to play alongside Chip Beck, plus you had some other great PGA Tour players there at Georgia right before your time, and, and our good friend Alan Miller, plus uh, Bill Kratzer as well. So talk about your time playing at UGA. Oh, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, of course, Chip and I were roommates. Uh, we're, we're still the closest of friends. Uh, we don't get to see each other very often anymore, but we talk on the phone and, uh, we have a very special relationship. Uh, we met obviously as freshmen at 18 years old. And, um, to, to this day, there has never been one single second of jealousy between either one of us. I mean, uh, when he won his first tournament on tour, we went out the night before at the LA Open. His little brother was caddying for him, Albert, and we went out to dinner and, uh, Chip was very nervous. And I told him, I said, it's your time. It is your time. You're going to win tomorrow. And, uh, I was, <clears throat> I finished kind of middle of the field and I'm at LAX getting ready to take off. And I, I walk, walking down the corridor and I walk by this bar and I watch him tap in and win and I just lost it. I started crying. And wow. he's Chip is one of the finest people God ever put on this earth. And, and, uh, I mean, we, we truly love each other like brothers. Uh, and we've, we've had a great, you know, just a phenomenal friendship over 40 years. Um, you know, we both had adversity obviously in our lives. Um, you know, he had some issues on, on tour and, and, uh, you know, with his swing and, and clubs and this and that and caused several years of, of poor play. Uh, and, of course, you know, at the peak of my career, after back-to-back -back years, top ten on the money list, you know, I got Lyme's disease in 1991, and uh, my health spiraled out of control. Uh, I should have retired long before I did, but I just kept kept believing I could somehow still play. But it was just so ravaging on my body, and I developed a tremor in my left hand known as essential tremor. Uh, I describe it as a non-fatal cousin of Parkinson's, although, as you know, it is fatal to your putting and chipping, <laughs> having a tremor <laughs> in your hand. But uh, anyway, I retired uh, from the PGA Tour in 97 and and uh, started teaching, and um, I – at the urgings of two college uh, players that I was teaching, that it was like I'd go out and I'd still be shaking and I wouldn't have played for two months and I'd take them out and I'd beat them. And they're like, you've got to start playing again. And I'm like, you know, I can't control myself. So they, they wouldn't stop until I said I'd play a few little tournaments. And I injured, I injured my rotator cuff somehow and I had to get an MRI. And this doctor told me, he said, I've been, I've been following you and you're doing okay. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'll never be any more than 50% of myself because I can't control my shaking in my left hand. And he said, have you ever heard of DVS surgery? And I said, no, sir. What's that? He said, that's deep brain stimulation. And he said, the best doctor in the world is right down the road in Augusta. And so I went to see him and, uh, they promptly scared me to death and, um, I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to be your guinea pig drilling in my head and poking stuff down in my brain. But, uh, I, I went back on medicine, uh, which I had taken before, you know, when I was still trying to play, uh, went to all the top neurologists from, from the head of Emory to the head of Tulane to the head of Loma Linda in California. And, um, anyway, I wasn't getting any better and I wanted to try to play. And so I agreed to do the brain surgery. And March 1st, 2005, I had a nine-hour procedure. And um, I have a, a kind of a pacemaker type thing in my upper chest attached to a wire that you can't see. But um, it's under my scalp, and it goes up. And then I have a brain probe that goes down in my brain, and it sends electronic stimulation uh, to the thalamic region of the brain and stop the tremor. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the great thing, Chris, was I was able to make a successful comeback on the Champions Tour. I did everything but win. I had two or three seconds. But I was able, I got so much publicity for the comeback that I was able to help so many people around the world. 
with neurological conditions. And, um, you know, I feel like that, that, that that's a big part of my legacy. You know, it, it's, I was the guy that would never give up, but also in the end, I was able to, to help people. And, and ironically, uh, in pursuit of getting in better shape, I met the head fitness writer for Golf Digest, played with him in a pro-am, and I'm like, come over to the fitness trailer and, and show me what the kids on tour are working on now. And they were doing a lot of stuff with the external hip flexors, you know, with the, with the hips trying, you know, obviously the quicker you can spin your hips, the quicker you can swing the club head. So he showed me some stuff to do and, and knowing full well better, uh, I overdid it. I was doing them twice a day and five days later I was warming up in Montreal at the Champions Tour event. And I tore my, uh, my, um, oh, dad gum it, uh, the muscle that goes from your knee up to your hip. Um, then I, I tore my quadratus lumborum. I pulled cartilage off my ribs and with one swing, my career was over for a second time. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's disheartening and I know God has a plan, but, you know, it's, it's not many top ten players that lose their career from, you know, something physical, but to lose it twice, you know, right? <laughs> kind of put. I, I mean, I'm I'm unlucky, I guess, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but but to, to that to that end, and there's so much to get into with what you just said, but. But you've persevered through a number of different injuries. You've had spinal fusion surgery, but you've come back twice. You talk about lose it twice. You came back twice, and you were comeback player of the year on both tours. Talk about persevering yeah. through all of that. Well, no, nobody ever in my life has called me a quitter. Um, you know, I was just – that was the way I was raised by my mother, that you never give up. You never, ever, ever give up. And that's what I've taught young players over the years. You get knocked down, get up and hit them again. You get knocked down again, get back up and hit them again. You just don't quit. And I think that's a, you know, that's a characteristic that all great players have. I mean, look at, look at Tiger. You know, it, it's, I mean, he doesn't need to prove anything, but in his heart, he wants to come back and win and play great again. And, um, it's just, um, you know, I have had a lot of tragedy in my life. You know, the funny thing is, and there's not a whole lot of people that know, but I've got, I guess you would call it a cripple left thumb. At seven years old, I severed my left thumb and, and cut the tendon in half. And then that would have been like 1962. They, there was no such thing as microsurgery. So they sewed it back up and I can't bend the top of my left thumb at all. So I had to learn to set the club totally different than everybody else because my wrist, left wrist, wouldn't bend at the top like everybody else. And I, I never looked at it as a as a negative or anything other than I was just over, going to overcome it. And, you know, history shows me as one of the greatest ball strikers ever. You know, so it's just, you know, I've just overcome a lot of adversities in, in my life. But, you know, that's life. You know, that's, that's, that's just life. I mean, I'm so lucky to have had the great life that I've had. And, and Tim, one other thing before we move on, because I want to talk about some of the victories you had out on tour, but, you know, you, you talked at, at length about the Lyme disease. Jimmy Walker has been dealing with the same. Have you and Jimmy had any conversation about how you were able, you know, to deal with what you had to deal with? No, and I'm a little surprised because I knew Jimmy a little bit years ago. Real, really, really class young man. And, uh, I'm really quite surprised that he hasn't contacted me. I, I probably should reach out to him through an email or, or just call him and, um, just say, Hey, I'm here. If you, if you want any questions, uh, answered that, that I might know about. And, you know, I still have people contact me. Uh, oh my gosh, you just can't imagine how many people over the years have contacted me and I still have people do it and I tell them, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert. All I can tell you is find a good, really good immune disease specialist, do what they say and somehow find a way to have a positive mental attitude. Because I'm telling you what, Chris, it ravages your body and there is no cure. You know, people say, oh, well, I had it one time, you know, and I'm like, no, if if you did have it, you still do, you know. So it uh, 
it, it's tough, but, you know, I wake up every day and I put a smile on my face. And, you know, although the older I get, the, the more I regret all the balls I hit. I was kind of VJ Singh before VJ. I mean, I beat them and beat them and beat them. And uh, 2016, I had three different back surgeries, and uh, they're wanting to do major surgery L4, L5 now. And uh, I just won't let them do it. So, Tim, let's go back to some happier times. Let's talk about the wins you had on tour. And 1985 was a big season for you. You got your first PGA Tour win at the Southern Open Championship down at Callaway Gardens in Columbus, Georgia. You won that tournament by two strokes over Clarence Rose. You opened with back-to-back rounds of 64 to really set the pace in that golf tournament. Talk about what you remember about your first tour victory. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, it sounds cliche, but... Chris, I just I just had an amazing inner peace that week. I just there was never any doubt, there was never any question, there was little to no nervousness. I just it it, it was like I was told it's your time, like I told Chip before he won L.A. And uh, ironically, Clarence Rose and I are great friends, and we partnered together in the team championship for years. Uh, I don't think we ever finished out of the top ten because um, we both made a lot of birdies, but it was it was incredible, and to do it to get my first PGA Tour victory in my home state was uh, was incredible, really incredible. And your second win came in in '89 at the US FNG Classic. You won that tournament by two strokes over Greg Norman and Hal Sutton. What was it like battling down the stretch against those two guys? Well, it was um, it, it was awesome because I was playing in the last group with Greg, and Greg was number one in the world, and and we were great friends, and and uh, you know you can imagine on the first tee, you know that's like, you know, with one tour victory from Atlanta, Tim Simpson, and then they read out five minutes of stuff, you know, on Greg, and and uh, off we go, and I tell him he's going off the first tee. You know, half those tournaments you won were daggum club championships and four balls and, <laughs> and that. <laughs> we're just laughing. But, you know, it was, it was amazing because, you know, Tom Kite and I were the first two players to start working with Bob Rotella. And uh, I want to say about 80, 83. And um, Bob and I had come up with a game plan the night before because my my former wife was not there. So he said, so basically, other than a couple of friends, you got to accept the fact there's going to be about thirty or forty thousand people assuming Greg's going to win. And he said, "You just got to just stay in your own game, you know, just stay loose." And I did, and we were still tied on uh, I think it was thirteen, and he was about one inch inside of me and about a quarter inch off my line. And I got a good read off his putt, and he missed it, and I center cut mine to take the lead. And the it, it, it was like nothing I've ever seen, Chris. The whole gallery flip-flopped. It was like everybody was pulling for me, screaming for me. Then two holes later, uh, on the par five, he knocks it on in two. I lay it up, and I stuff it in there about 10 feet, and – uh he runs it by about five feet, and I make mine, and he misses his. Now, I got a two-shot lead, and then on 16, I stuck the dagger in his heart where I hit a, I think it was an eight iron from the fairway and hit the pin, almost went in, and uh, and it was pretty much over. But uh, I, but then he gets his revenge on me the next year, the dog. He At, <laughs> at, at Doral, we, we have a four-way playoff with uh, uh, Azinger, Calc, Calcavecchia, me and Greg. And, of course, Greg shoots 64-64 on the weekend to get in a dead gum playoff. Anyway, so we all three hit number one in two. I'm on the back friend. Zinger and Calc are on the green. Greg hits it over the green, and it looked like an elephant stepped on it. It's in five-inch Bermuda. He's dead. And Calc misses. Zinger misses. Greg hits it, and the damn thing runs like a rabbit right in the hole. And wow. I feel to this day, every time I see him, I tease him about it. I'm like, don't, don't you even tell me you didn't chunk that ball. You know, you <laughs> mishit it to the luckiest person. And then, of course, my dead gum putt does a 180 and comes back out the front, and he gets the trophy. And I'm like, well, you got your revenge. 
But uh, <laughs> that that was probably probably my biggest thrill because you know it was like going head to head, you know, eight years ago or so with Tiger. I mean, Greg was number one in the world. He was Superman. Yeah. And uh, but my two two Disney wins were fantastic and and um, you know very very fond memories. I t- tell you a cute story. You know, as, as part of winning. We used to have the Oldsmobile scramble. So as part of the, the winner's check, you also got a new Olds 98 PGA edition. It was had every option on it you could get. So this was in 89, the first year I win. The, the next tournament is the Tour Championship, and it's at Harbortown. And, of course, you know, we've gone over. I'm in the last group. Anyway, my caddies buddies, the, the other caddies he's riding up to Hilton Head with, said uh they left him and so he's like i don't have a ride to hilton head so tom pond the executive director uh with with buick is standing or oldsmobile is standing there and he says well what's the deal with the car mr pond and he said what's well, tim's decision i mean he can take that one or we can send one to atlanta or whatever he wants to do and and todd says do y'all have the keys to it and i said and he said yeah Todd got in the car, drove it off the 18th green, down the cart path, right to Harbor Town. <laughs> All he did was put gas in. He drove it off the green, and then he drove it to my house in Atlanta after the tournament. <laughs> and that's how I got the car, and, of course, I gave it to my dad. But I thought, you know. <laughs> and Mr. Pine Classic. said, I've never, had, I, I've never had that ass before. <laughs> Can we drive it off the green? <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. And, you know, Tim, just one other point about that 89 Disney win, because you, you beat a couple of good friends of ours here on the show, and Donnie Hammond and Kenny Knox. And, you know, Zinger was in that, so was Freddie Couples. But curious to understand what, what it was like competing against Donnie and Kenny. Um, it, it was great. I remember Donnie was ecstatic because, uh, you know, we, we were always friends, as as I am with Kenny. And, and uh we, Donnie walks into the score tent before we tee off there. We, we're in the last group on Sunday. And Donnie says, um, uh, Timbo, as long as I finish second, I'll be happy because that will get me in the tour championship next week. And that that's how we started off the day. And it wasn't a defeatist attitude. It was just, you know, that was his goal to get in the in the tour championship. And uh, he he got what he wanted. <laughs> he finished second. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. That's exactly and, and Tim, right. And you're teaching the game now. Talk about you know how you're going about you know teaching you know students now. How you motivate them and the things that you do to get the get young people interested in the game. You know what, Chris? I, I don't promote myself at all. People just have a way of finding me either through the website or word of mouth or what have you. But. You know, in, in, in my whole PGA Tour career, and, and this is not meant as a criticism to my fellow players and friends, but, but I mean, out of a 1,000 tour players I saw come down the pike over my career, or 800, however many there are, I wouldn't recommend five or ten of them to give you a golf lesson. You know, that in, in other words, they were great players, but they couldn't teach. And I'm, I'm talking about some Hall of Famers, too. They just couldn't teach it. But it's something I've always enjoyed. It's something I've always been able to do. And I think teaching, and I think you would agree, is, uh, say, 50% knowledge and at least 50% communication. And, you know, I'm not into track man and this and that. It's, I believe, especially with a good player, when I, when I say a good player, a lower handicap player, which I would say 12 or less handicap, you know, that, that they have feel. And I, I believe, and, and it worked for me my whole career, and I've seen it work for a lot of people, I believe if I can give you a drill at the first swing, you have this aha moment, and you look at me and you say, holy moly, can I feel that? And, and then I say, there you go. Because my argument is, if you can feel it, you can change it. In other words, if I try to baffle you with my knowledge by drawing angles and lines on a computer, and saying your plane is off, to me, that's like saying you wrecked your car. You know, it's kind of the obvious. Let's let's get to the bottom of fixing, Chris. You know, and if I can give you a key that you can feel, that you can take on the golf course and immediately hit good shots with, that's what it's all about. 
And I also believe that, that you know, when I get a, a real advanced player, I mean, a real good college player or a young pro or something, I believe more times than not, I teach a lot like Butch Harmon. And we've always been friends, and I love the way Butch teaches. He's very simplistic. It would shock you how simple he keeps it. And I'm the same way. And my, my thing is, I don't think there's a need to rebuild the whole race car. Let's just change a spark plug. Let's just tweak it here and there. And, um, and, and, and I've, I've, I've been very successful, you know, with, with doing that with players. You know, I, I just don't make it ultra complicated. Um, I just don't, you know, and the, I think the, the, you know, when a guy was re- recently asked me, he, he said, you know, when you were stuffing it in there three feet, it seemed like every other hole, what, what were you thinking your whole career? And it was like, target. They're like, no, no, but you had a swing thought. I mean, you know, turn the shoulders, smooth transition, drive the legs. And it was like, no. You know, it's I just had, for a kid that grew up extremely ADHD, they just didn't know what that was 50 years ago, I learned, I, I developed somehow, Chris, an, an a very acutely intensive level of concentration. The stuff that bothered my, my fellow players, I didn't even hear. And it was like I laser focused my mind on my target and it was going there. And then when I would do exhibitions over the years, you know, I would be hitting balls and I would tell people, you know how important it is to have proper alignment. Well, watch this. And you line up 50 yards left and you hit it right over the flag. Then you line up dead square and hit it over the flag. Then you line up 40 yards right and hit it over the flag. How do you do it? Well, a lot of it's feel and talent, but it's your mind knows where that intended target is like a a third baseman that catches a hot shot down the line you know he grabs the ball he steps steps and it's not until the microsecond before he releases it that his eyes ever see the first baseman but he knew where he was the whole time so i think it's it's wow mental focus mental focus and i shoot competition archery now I shoot traditional archery, which is the hardest of all because there's no sights. I shoot long bows and recurves, and it's it's the same way. It's you focus on your target and you trust your mind is going to elevate your hand and arm to the proper place to deliver that area that arrow into a three inch circle at 30 yards. You know, and there there are no sights. This isn't compound archery. I mean, this is what the Indians did. And it's the same thing. It's it's focus. It's mental focus. So, Tim, I'm sure you've piqued a lot of our listeners' interest. For those that want to reach out to you that might be interested in getting a lesson for themselves or getting a lesson for their junior player, how can they find you? Uh, they can contact me through my website, timsimpsongolf.com. Uh, I do motivational speaking. I teach, and I can't do corporate outings anymore because I, I haven't been able to play in about 16 months now. I did hit balls uh, two weeks ago, first time I hit a driver in a year. But uh, my, my low back's really giving me fits. But, but yeah, they can contact me that way and uh, ig- ignore the, the Twitter and Facebook that's on the website. I don't ever keep up with those. But uh, I have a Tim Simpson personal Facebook account. Uh, they they can find me that here in Georgia and communicate with me. And uh, I live at Lake Oconee. Um, you probably heard of Reynolds Plantation, or now it's called Reynolds. Yep. And then next door, the sister community is a fantastic Tom Weisskopf, Jay Marsh course, and that's where I live at Harbor Club. Uh, we were voted number three in the state last year. It's a great golf course. Well, Tim, I have thoroughly enjoyed this time, and, just, and, and, and there's so many other things I'd love to get your thoughts and insights on. I hope you'll come back and join me again sometime. You're fantastic. Oh, I, I would love it. I would love it. I, I lead, uh, Chris, you'd be shocked. I lead a quiet life. I shoot arrows, and I live with my dog. <laughs> you know, I'm just an old bachelor, and I live a quiet life. You know, drive a truck, don't drive a Mercedes. You know, I, I just love comp- competing in archery and you know you mentioned i won the 25 and under world championship in 1981 and that's my goal is i want to win a world championship in traditional archery so i can say i, I won a world championship in two different sports i think that'd be pretty cool 
Yeah, it would be very cool. Good for you. I hope you do it. And I hope you'll come back and talk all about it because, uh, like I said, I, I, I can't tell you how much fun this last segment of the show has been, and, uh, and I thank you very much for that. Well, call me anytime. It, it was my privilege to be on, and uh, I wish everybody a, a wonderful golfing year, and, uh, and, and most importantly, enjoy the game. Enjoy the game. I think uh, there you go. And and I and, and and I think you know from all my talks with Bob Rotella, I was struggling recently with my archery, and he said, "Timbo, you're you're making it too complicated." He said, "You know, all I can tell you, whether you're kicking a football, pitching a baseball, hitting a tennis ball, or hitting a golf ball, the more unconscious you can go, the better you'll play." And that's my advice to amateurs. It's not that maybe you're not ha- not having an issue with a you know, hook or you know what have you and maybe you need a lesson but when you play focus on your target and watch the results because your your mind is amazing there you go great advice tim again thank you for your time tim simpson golf.com folks go check it out tim hopefully we get the privilege of having you back on the show again real soon anytime chris my honor ah thank you tim take care all the best to you and your family my friend thank you sir bye-bye See ya. That is Tim Simpson. Again, TimSimpsonGolf.com, four-time winner on the PJ Tour. Boy, that was a lot of fun. Holy cow. Hopefully we get to get Tim back on the show again real soon. All right, folks, it is time for us to put a bow on this episode of Next on the T. Before we close up shop, though, you know how we like to remind you about all the great things that Jim Estes and the folks over at the Salute Military Golf Association are doing. Give a listen to Jim. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, folks, Jim and his uh, his team continue to do amazing things there at the Salute Military Golf Association. To find out more information and to see how you can get involved, go online to smga.org. All right, folks, time to put a bow on this episode. My sincere thanks again go out to Charlie Fisher, Travis Fulton, and Tim Simpson for joining me tonight. And I hope you all enjoyed the show. Please give me your thoughts. Check out our page, Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro on Facebook. Share your feedback there. Plus, if you've got a question for one of our future guests or someone who's recently been on the show, please let me know. Be sure to get it on the air for you uh, or pass it along and get the, the answer to that question for you. You can check out who some of our future guests are going to be by going online to our website, nextonthetee.net. Please also check out our sister show on the football side with me and my co-host, Bob Lazari, our announcer, Joe Lajanusa, Thursday night tailgate. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. You can stream it live on Blog Talk Radio. And that show, like this one, also available as a podcast on iHeartRadio and Podbean as well. On Thursday night tailgate, we're joined every week by five NFL legends coming on to share their stories from their playing days, plus insights into what's going on around the NFL. We also highlight two players doing great things in their communities in our Spotlight on the Positive segment as well, so you want to check that out. You can find that show online at ThursdayNightTailgate.com, and again, this show next on the T.net. Folks, thank you so much for choosing to listen to this show today. We know you've got a lot of radio shows and podcasts you have the opportunity to listen to. We really appreciate the fact you're making Next on the T one of them. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday to hear more stories about the game we love from 
people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.